Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel session on sustainability in the media industry. Um, we've all seen the record temperatures recently, and you know we really need to do something about that. So this panel session is about working together to um, make a real difference. So my name's Steve Amor. Uh, I'm in Media and Broadcast. I'm the moderator today. I have uh, Cedric Lejeune here, uh, CEO of Workflowers and Carbon Pilot. Ross Kemp, um, Head of Connectivity and Strategy and Architecture at the BBC. Katie Tallon, Industry Sustainability Manager at BAFTA Albert. And Abdul Hakim. And, and I'm the DPP's Sustainability Lead. So. Yeah. Leading on things like the DPP um, sus uh, Committed to Sustainability Accreditation. That's right, yeah. Fantastic. So, um, let's start with the first question then. Uh, so, Cedric, what's the biggest contributing factor um, that can have significant impact on reducing your carbon footprint in this industry? Uh, well, this industry is using a lot of... Uh, people, I mean, right now, creative people and everything, so the, uh, everything regarding the, the buildings and all that, um, the transportation, uh, fuel, uh, accounts to sometimes more than 50% of the, of the carbon footprint. So that's certainly something where um, there is a, a large scope for improvement. Yeah. Okay, and I think that, that fits in very well with Albert, doesn't it? Um, did I yeah. see a statistic the other day about hotels as well? Yeah, so, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, BAFTA, at BAFTA Albert, we, we, get, uh, we, we have an online carbon calculator tool for productions to calculate the emissions associated with the production. And we've been going for a number of years. It means that we've got 10, uh, over 10,000 uh, productions worth of data. And pre-COVID, the average emissions associated with a production, we're talking all genres here, um, and obviously some genres like like live sport and drama and things have higher emissions but on average um an hour of tv is producing about 10 tons of carbon dioxide a year that's about what we're all producing in the developed world in a per person per year um just for equivalent and around about 50 percent of that is coming from um from transport um and travel so travel will include hotel and accommodation um, you know, because you're going to have to obviously put up your crew somewhere. They're going to be eating, um, uh, etc. So, um, yeah, yeah, significant proportion of, of emissions from travel. And um, so, Ross, from the BBC's point of view, what's what do you see as the biggest contributing factor? So, thinking about the numbers for a minute, and I think this is going to be a reoccurring thread that appears throughout the conversation that we have this afternoon. Actually. Um, if we're looking at our, let's say, the scopes of measurement, scope one, so scope one is the amount of fuel you consume as an organization, scope two is the, uh, electri your electricity bill, uh, and scope three uh, is the supply chain. It's basically everything else. For the BBC, and we're just getting these verified at the moment by the, uh, the Carbon Trust, we've measured 2% of our carbon emissions is scope one and scope two. So that means 98% is the wow. rest. And what might make up the rest, you think? Well, we think broadly uh, of that, around about 70% or thereabouts is in our technology-related uh, supply chain. And so if we, I mean, the measurements are really interesting. The BBC is definitely post COP26. Uh, this year is what we're calling our sort of foundation and discovery year. We want to get our house in order, in order that, because we're going to be obliged as part of the uh, Task Force for Climate Related uh, Financial Disclosures from next year uh, to be reporting uh, annually uh, on this. And so we're going to need to get some long-term science-based science data uh, captured on this. And so from our point of view, pointing back to those numbers again, the most important bit for us is focusing on the supply chain. We've got our scope one, we've got our scope two, we've got our net zero by 2030 policy within the BBC. And we've got measurable approaches to that, which include things like green energy. It includes things like sustainable investment in, in buildings and the way we build things. Um, but we can't ignore that massive scope three. Thank you. Um, Abdul, we've heard a bit about Albert. Um, what, what's the, could you tell us a bit about the DPP committed to security? Uh, sure, yeah. Sustainability? Yeah, sure. Uh, but before I go to that, I'd just like to comment on, on your question there. And actually, and what you said there, um, both Cedric and yourself, 
absolutely right. The, the bulk of the emissions for most media organizations will sit in the production space. So if you are a media organization and looking to prioritize what you do, obviously there's limited resources available. So if you are prioritizing, actually making sure that you're reducing the impact of your productions is where you'd focus your attention on. And actually RTL Netherlands um, did a huge study on this to actually quantify where the bulk of the emissions reside. In their, in their study, it was in the production space. So, so what they're doing is really focusing on reducing the impact of their carbon emissions during productions, and they're working with Albert to do so. Um, and, and just on, on, on the BBC there as well, so uh, a few years ago, the BBC published a white paper, uh, and a, a quite a detailed white paper on the impact of the carbon emissions from television uh, distribution through to uh, the viewership as well. And actually, in their study, they calculated that 0.6% of the UK's uh, electricity use is, comes from um, acquiring BBC content and distributing it. So it's, if, you, if you look at the magnitude of that, it's huge. Yeah. And if you then multiply that with ITV and Channel 4 and just in the UK alone, that's, that's massive. It adds up. So yeah, so to answer your question now about the DPP committed to sustainability program, so uh, just just a bit of background around that. A, a few years ago, we heard from a lot of senior executives from from the broadcast and media community around how, and whilst they're getting their houses in order around starting to measure their impacts and things like that, they critically they acknowledged that they critically relied on a supply chain, and in that supply chain space, there was no way of effectively um, looking at the environmental credentials of their potential suppliers and this is going to become hugely important as we go into so in, in, into new regulatory spaces but the broadcasters knew that this is going to be a, a, a challenge and so what we did was we got our members together to develop a scheme to enable suppliers in the industry so and at a strategic level at an organizational level to demonstrate that they're working towards reducing their environmental impact and that's what the DVP committed to sustainability program is about and, and, and I will delight to say that BT are a huge supporter of that and, and they've achieved a really high score in, in, ta in taking part in the program. Um, Katie, if I, if I may ask, um, could you just give us your views on like human behaviour and what we can do to, because you know that plays a big part in the production side of things where, where all this, um, you know, we can make a change and I think human behaviour is a big, big contributor to that. Yeah, sure. I mean, if we if we focus, as we quite rightly should, on, on travel and energy, which are the large proportions of a carbon footprint of production, um, I mean, lo lots of um, techniques. And we, we try to constantly, through data, educate people. Let's not just focus on reuse, reducing plastic water bottles on set. You know, it's really insignificant and we need to start... Um, focusing on on the there is a big impact so human behavior you know car sharing active travel um, uh, employing local crew uh, obviously remote cloud-based technology um, <laughs> which we hopefully can come on and talk to um, uh, yeah, all things that you probably know but uh, it what's really important is that as crew I guess and and producers we feel like we can take action and that we're making a difference because it's only in that action space where you feel positive and optimistic I think and uh, when you sort of just feel like you're in a polluting industry it's not as um, heartwarming <laughs> I guess you know it's nice to be part of a, a cutting edge sustainable um, industry and Cedric um, could you just tell us a little bit about measuring the what? impact and yeah, benchmarking uh, <laughs> and things like that as was mentioned um, what is difficult in there is the um, everything else the, the scope yeah. three you know, they uh, um, we have to get. I mean, in the in the GHG protocol, so greenhouse gas uh, protocol, th th there is a, a methodology that is international and everything, but it just gives guidelines. So it's actually extremely difficult to compare within that framework between one company and another. And uh, there is the good thing is there is an initiative right now at the European level, and actually Albert is part of that uh, initiative uh, of. Uh, making the different methodologies for audiovisual carbon emission calculation converge uh, towards one method, one common methodology, so we can start to have just a good order of magnitude. Because one of the problems we have to is the fact that you may have two machines, and since they are not using the same protocol and don't measure exactly the same thing, you don't exactly compare 
apples to apples. A and that's really where, uh, right now, we are, I mean, we are still at the very early beginning of this process. Right now, uh, a carbon assessment is, a, is mostly something you do to get people aware of, of, of this problem and get into the process of calculating things but it might be a bit deceptive in a sense that you calculate something somewhere and somewhere else and you will have completely different results. And I want to say completely it can be uh, 20 and 80 for the same thing. So this is where we actually need to, 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 get, to, to, to get to the next step where we can have um, real actions and everything and start to, to compare elements in the industry. Uh, we need to have more accurate kind of, of protocols. Super, thank you. If I could just comment that as well. So it's going to become super important for most organizations to increase the accuracy of, of the data that they're yeah. providing around sustainability. So we've got regulations coming up in, 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 in EU as well as the US around um, uh, environmental reporting. And part of what the requirements will entail is the making sure that the accuracy of the data is there and that it's audited and validated and in fact, it will become just as material and important as financial data. So imagine the amount of rigor that goes into producing financial reports. The same level of rigor will be required on your environmental data. So that's going to become the next some sort of priority area for, for the industry. For everyone who has a customer, if you're UK-based, if you've got a customer in the US, especially given that most of the major US organizations are listed, um, those requirements will come to to the UK effectively, yeah. and and that's one point. There is the sorry, the, the, there is the, the methodology, but also the database you use. So, for example, uh, we are working right now. We are developing the the carbon calculator for EcoProd, which is a French um, organization for the broadcasters and producers to work together. And we need to find ways so that because it's a it's pretty much the same as currency. You, you said finance needs to align with carbon. But right now, uh, we don't have the concept of common currency where all the stuff measure the same thing. So we need to agree on the fact that, okay, a camera is this. A, uh, 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 so we all use the same um, tools and numbers to, to be able to add them. It might sound stupid, but that's really where we are today. So sometimes it, it, it can be a bit uh, difficult to make that happen. So Ross, I know the BBC have been collaborating with um, some of their supply chain already what, what what have you been talking about and what what benefits does that bring so from our point of view the supply chain going back to the point i made before is is, is absolutely key and actually we've looked quite closely uh, at our own supply chain and actually we think broadly 60 out of that 70 percent that we're looking at comes from pretty much our top six suppliers uh, the joy of which of course with bt <laughs> being 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 one of those uh, so happy occasion that we can work together on this one and actually, it was off the back of the DPP Leaders Summit last year that a conversation got started uh, about what we could do um, if we were to work together within the, the current contracts and without moving too far out to make it too abnormal, not pushing more money in, for instance, into the financial side, which at the moment would have the unfortunate effect of making us appear to be worse because the current measures are unfortunately looking mostly at finance, so totally uh, committed to the point that we're making about having measurable uh, components moving forward, science-based uh, measurements. But uh, so far, we've set up a number of work streams uh, in this collaboration. And the one I think that is most exciting is really quite a simple one. Uh, it's the concept that in modern televisions, when you've got fully saturated pictures, you're using considerable more power uh, than when they're showing a black screen. And so one of the things that I was hoping, Mark, he's not around actually at the moment, Mark Patrick from the BBC, who's done a little bit of research on this very crudely uh, with our Blue Room friends, uh, also a part of the BBC who look into uh, technology futures and, and, and so on. Uh, and he simply made the point from this basic experiment that a single screen showing full colour bars, which is what most of our industry use as park sources uh, to leave uh, some sort of confidence feed on a television, uh, can use 100 watts more power than when that television is just showing black. And so if you look at that as a saving, the equivalent of a good old fashioned 100 watt tungsten light bulb, most of which we've managed to get rid of in the UK on the grounds of their uh, consumption, we can already start thinking of this in several different ways. We can talk about educating those who consume on televisions about some of the benefits of buying modern TVs at the one end, but let's get the industry ready at the other 
for the next time you do a gallery replacement of your screens or whatever, uh, and make us start questioning what we'd actually use as our park sources. So we're going around with a bit of a sort of campaign at the moment mm -hmm. right, in IBC this year about a topic we're loosely calling eco bars. What do we use bars for? They're a confidence feed that a signal is there. Do they need to be fully saturated colours that historically used to be used for lineup and a number of other mm -hmm. things as well? Probably not. Let's get this concept out in the open now. This is a discussion that we're sharing with BT as a supplier and a partner, but also BT as a broadcaster. So it's something very relevant in your blood just as much as it is in ours. So if we can get that out there, the next time we're looking at our refreshments of signals, the next time we're looking at what we do in this space, maybe we can use eco bars as a way of pushing something forward. Uh, other areas, another fairly obvious bit of low-hanging fruit, but probably also familiar to us in the industry, switch stuff off. There's loads of stuff sitting there that is just left on, humming away at the moment uh, in our apparatus rooms and spaces. I've spent 22 years in the BBC mostly building things. Um, other than when we closed Television Centre, um, I would be the one to admit I probably haven't turned as much stuff off over the years uh, as I've installed and put on. And just, just while I'm holding the floor, one other area, there's five in total, but a third one um, of relevance here. What cost is coding? You know, the higher the qualities, the higher the resolutions we as an industry are putting out at the moment, are they really conscious of just how much additional cost is going into making the highest end of 4K and 8K content? End-to-end -end cost. I mean, I thought you made the point about the <laughs> BBC's <laughs> consumption in the home is the 0.2%. If we've suddenly got 4K and 8K content all over the place uh, and it's become a common thread, how much more will we have made that number go up? So. There's a lot we can do within the grounds of our existing relationship, and I think that's really important because, one, one, in fact, one other of my colleagues is wandering around at the moment, and I asked him for uh, a few thoughts on this one, and he said it's fundamental. He said it's just down to human behavior. Mm. It, there are so many things that we could do in each of these spaces that will actually make a difference, and provided many, many, many of us make just that little bit of adjustment, this will make a huge outcome. Yeah, on the te technology side, totally with you, there's so much improvement and it combines with, with behavior in a sense that um, uh, five years ago I used to have a graphics workstation and when I would switch it on, it will eat one kilowatt, whatever I do with it. <laughs> now with newer technology, yeah. as, as you said, for because it was exactly the same for, for TVs, with CRTs, it didn't think it's because now we have newer technologies like LED and everything that are more power efficient that we yep. can use that, but exactly the same with uh, PCs and everything. My PC at home, when I'm doing emails, it's 60 watts. When I'm doing some uh, video editing, it's like 150, and when I'm doing real time 3D stuff, it's 240. Yeah. And it's also very important because in, in our tool that we develop to help uh, design uh, scenarios and, and, and workflows, um, we get gather that data so then we can provision the right amount of electricity and also uh, cooling systems because <laughs> cooling systems have a terrible impact over the environment. Have to consider that the, uh, um, the, 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 the gas that I use in cooling systems uh, have a, uh, a heating, well, they, uh, the, the, uh, in French it's PRG, but I don't know in, in English, but the, uh, the, the, the fact that the, the impact of those gases is one to 3,000 times worse than CO2 for mm. the, uh, the, the warming effect. Mm. So every single, and, and, and do the, the, um, the cooling systems, they do leak. So, and, and the bigger they are, obviously the more they leak. Uh, and so the, the, the smaller you get your cooling systems and the, the most fit and lean your infrastructure is to actually um, get your service done first uh, will c cost you less, and especially on the energy side, it's becoming a, a very hot topic. And that's also something we try to do in our tools because it's, it's, it's suddenly there. But also on the carbon footprint, uh, at some point, you can really uh, have a, a better understanding. So we need statistics, we need more information coming from the people using stuff, and we need them to collaborate. Because right now, we have silo, so people start the machine because someone will use it. Yeah. But uh, getting stuff off, is actually talking with someone to know when will you use it and when you will use and, and all that stuff. Automating that is actually a, a huge task. It's extremely difficult. And I guess uh, coming back to the human behavior thing again, it's about education. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, definitely. Like I, I was going to round off this this section up actually with education. So, um, and the carbon footprinting can be a great education tool because you can produce pie charts and really see yeah. those areas of impact and where I think you you know your role in it. But um, we found it again at Albert, which has been running for ten years. We um, our training is now mandatory, and it's not just about carbon footprinting. It's about taking a actions in your role. Um, but it was very much before it became a mandatory part of UK the production industry. It was very much just very junior members of production teams engaging in it. And now it's I, you know I'm training. I, I trained 12 CEOs of UK broadcasters <laughs> six months ago, and we're talking about risk management, and we're talking about you know opportunity and young audiences and everything else, um, which is which has been exciting. But there's still. Um, there's still quite a few, um, I, I guess, gaps where we're not reaching people, journalists being one where, you know, there's a sceptical <coughs> bunch who think they know everything. Um, but we, we are having to create different types of learning experiences for them, for busy people who can't necessarily take time out to do training, but, y you know, e-learning and, and uh, other such things. But we, it's definitely been a palpable shift in the interest of pe and, and seniority of people who are now going through training. And are you seeing any other examples of collaboration yeah. I mean, Al Albert's been uh, a, like a, an exemplar of radical collaboration in an <laughs> otherwise competitive industry. It feels really competitive over there in the exhibition <laughs> stand, <laughs> sorry. But um, no, I mean, we, we our, our um, business is, is funded by um, a directorate and consortia of, um, of leading broadcasters and production companies from all over the world. And it's brilliant. And people are really sharing learning you know, openly and, and really candidly. Um, and then, I mean, all of our projects as well, we get involved in, and uh, I hope we talk about the IBC Accelerator project. Um, I'm sure we will, but um, yeah, that was, you know, fantastic collaboration. Um, and in, in a number of ways, not just in a project, but actually sharing galleries and live camera feeds. And, you know, do we all need an, a separate OB truck on every single, you know, shoot from every single broadcaster? What about sharing <laughs> novel idea but yeah um it, it, everything's cl about collaboration and sustainability because uh, it's a global problem and it's um we've got to tackle it together i'll just pick up on that collaboration mm -hmm. one in education one actually for a minute because the other great thing that i think came from a bafta initiative from the cop 26 was the um the uh, climate content pledge uh, that came out so the education not just of all of our staff and audience within our buildings but of course trying to weave in everything we possibly can uh, to basically reach more of our audiences with content that will help everyone understand and navigate the path uh, to net zero and inspire them to make greener choices so product placing all sorts of things in relation to the environment things like east enders at the one end so right in our content thank you um there's a question over there Stephen. oh sorry yeah we have a question I think from our point of view, I think this is where the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures work is <coughs> going to become really important because that is something that we will be obliged, the 1,300 largest country, country companies in the UK will be obliged to report on this from next year and then onwards. So I think you'll see in parallel a development of science-based targets and actually there's the um, International Sustainability Standards Board uh, that has been established and will have uh, this uh, task force for climate related financial disclosures beneath it and actually over time the BBC is looking to also align with the task force for uh, nature related financial disclosures as well so that will force us to inspect our supply chain not just from a financial and consumption of emissions point of view but things like biodiversity what decisions are we making in our program making that might have impact on deforestation yeah. uh, for example and so on and so forth in blunt targets, we've set our net zero by 2030 target. For us, that's all an, an all-electric fleet by 2030. That's green energy. Uh, we, in fact, we have green energy in all our buildings now, but it's going to be an improvement towards reduction of actual fossil fuel consumption. So we've said we will use 25% less gas by 2025, 30% less gas by 2030. So we've set real measurable targets, and I think, Cedric, you might help here. The task force, those, those disclosures that we will now need to make in our obligatory mandatory reporting, in our annual reports, will need those longer-term-based, based, longer -term -based, scientific-based measures. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you're right, and, and I'm referring back to what you said earlier, that it is only 2% of it yeah. in terms of savings. 
but now if we can go more in detail, it, 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 you talk about SMB you, truck. Sort of, although there's, there's one key subtlety on that one. Our capital spend falls into our scope three. Yeah. So the amount that we spend on travel, the amount that we spend on buying stuff yes. uh, that we install in our buildings and so on, that fits into scope three. But it's still broadly 10 to 12 percent or thereabouts of what it is. Okay. Um, but it's absolutely an area so we must look at. So you're directly to the financial... Yeah. Well, that, that's sorry. That, that's that's where actually that's the first step finance because as you said earlier, the problem is if you only look at finance and apply a factor to it, the only way to reduce is actually to reduce the business. Doesn't doesn't work. So the next step is actually to have what is called a bottom-up approach. Yeah. So you actually measure the equipment. You get the uh, so you can pick between two technologies. The one that has the least impact and it may actually be more expensive, but have a, a lesser impact. And, th and this is where actually the, the, the financial abstraction uh, doesn't work. So fi the finance uh, uh, way of doing it is, I would say, a, a great way to go quickly to the right space. But then once you get into actions, you need to have a bottom-up ap approach. And, and that is technically what we are doing with uh, mm -hmm. our clients to build things where we can actually compare. But where it becomes difficult to compare, coming back to the previous topic, is if you don't have the same kind of, of measurements between two technologies, then you have an issue, but we're working on that. So, so you got my point. So that was my question. Is there any standard organization who is working on these kinds of... We, we're working on, on, on this. Uh, uh, all the people developing carbon calculators in yeah. Europe right now are collaborating. So there was, a, there was a European project to make all those methodologies converge to one unique standard. Yes. Well, we, we, have a, we go beyond, because carbon footprinting is the first step. Yeah. Yes. And the next step is reducing those emissions and then finally offsetting any unavoidable um, emissions is the sort of gold standard. But uh, at Albert, we certify productions as carbon neutral sustainable productions, but they have to have met certain criteria. And because the Albert certification is mandatory for all UK uh, produ productions and commissions, we are driving down emissions. You're not allowed to take a domestic flight um, in, in, to be Albert certified. Um, and we also have a transport hierarchy, so you have to have shown how you've worked on reducing your transport-related emi emissions and, and made sure that you've, you're taking sustainable um, options where possible. So that's one way that we're, we're sort of sh showcasing that, that reductions are, um, can happen. Um, and on the financial data point, the BBC recently partnered with Carbon Trust who did an audit comparing the bottom-up approach, yeah. comparing just the financial approach, and, and you know did find, although there's flaws in in our methodologies, as we're mm. talking about, but the, the definitely that's the way forward. Um, yeah. The more granular, you know, uh, yeah. data. So certainly, in in the broadcast and media industry, there's a lot more that needs to be done, and, and we're, 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 we've made a start. But certainly, there's more to be done. If we look at other sectors, so in the telecoms industry, so the GS GSMA um, and a consortium of mobile network operators, including EE and others have partnered together to develop something called eco-rating devices. And that's a great example of the industry and community coming together. That kind of approach won't work together, work in our sector because our sector operates differently. In the mobile space, the telco, uh, the telco operators, the mobile network operators, they've got a lot of buying powers because they could influence their suppliers more heavily. So what they've actually done is they've worked with um, mobile phone manufacturers, most of the major manufacturers apart from Apple and, and Google at the moment, but all other major um, phone manufacturers. And for each of those devices, they, you are able to get a, new, a standardized nutrition label for each device. So if you're buying a handset from any, any mobile phone operator now, you go in and see what the environmental credentials are. And what they've set on is five different metrics which they measure effectively. And they include things like the repairability of a device, the recyclability of a device, the carbon emissions, energy consumption, and there's one other which I forget. Um, but actually, we could learn from that. Yeah. So one of the things that I've been trying to advocate in our industry is actually, can we get to a position where at least qualitatively, forget doing it quantitatively because that's going to be difficult to begin with, but at least qualitatively, can we use those five kind of metrics to describe our products with in 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 prose effectively so you've got a opportunity there to you know, describe whatever product or service you're providing um 
using those metrics in those, in, in, in the, in those considerations. And actually, um, I was just um, at the Google stand earlier on, and with their Google TV product, they've done something similar. So they've taken a similar approach to using these five kind of metrics. I haven't seen exactly what those metrics are, but they've done something similar. So I think there's there's a lot we can learn from that from the from the mobile phone industry. And what they've achieved is absolutely amazing because they've used a common um, assessment approach as well. We've spoken a lot about um, about calculating. Um, so, w- if people are, are doing that, what's the one sort of thing you'd say to them to be aware of apart from the scope three? What's the what what should they really be aware of when they're calculating their carbon footprint? <laughs> or maybe like it is just <laughs> the scope yeah. three. That's <laughs> <detail>. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot. Of, um, uh, the first thing, and that's part of, again, the, the GHG protocol, is actually define the... Um, so, the, we're talking about the scope, so it's a different scope, the scope one, two, three, but also the, what you're actually measuring, and, and try to be sure to be exhaustive within that. Uh, because, for example, um, well, there's been in our industry, there's been a lot of calcu- carbon calculators that have been designed, everything, and, and, and made better and all that, but uh, at some point, uh, first, it was uh, most of them were on, f- on fiction and drama, and uh, a lot of them, since they didn't know how to calculate post-production, they didn't calculate post-production. Or and you have a lot of things where it's just like, okay, we don't know how to do it, so we don't do it. So that, that a, 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 and that's sometimes a bit deceptive because you miss. I mean, at least you need to find ways to estimate and, and find the balance because if you miss, I mean, it's it's it's, it's for example in an extra financial report. Uh, it's this thing that companies provide to their shareholders and everything, and, and it starts with actually what did we calculate, and you just have to d- to say okay I didn't take account of the transportation thing that I mean you you, you can you just define you know I- in a report what you measured and what you don't measure it's not exactly there but some stuff can be extremely important some stuff is constrained something just like you people get to the office and eat stuff. <laughs> so that is extremely difficult to compress, whether you have a leverage over what people eat, but that's different, depending on the organization, it's not a leverage a lever at all. But then it's, uh, if you want to be able to compare things between different companies and different, um, uh, you, you need to define the, uh, the, the, the same um, things you will measure. So depending on the uh, goal. If when people get into the, um, uh, you know, the the, the, the action and, and, and want to to measure things, the first thing they need to ask themselves is what I'm measuring, what I will be uh, missing, and uh, and why am I measuring? Because if it's to compare with something else, you need to be make sure you you measure the same things. So it sounds like actually, um, if you're embarking on this journey. Um, be aware that there is a lot of work to do. Oh, yeah. um, there's lots of people to help you, and it's great that uh, CEOs are buying into all of this as well. Um, so they'll realise how much there is a lot of work by the sounds of it. It's not going anywhere in the industry. I mean, yeah. like, uh, we said we talked about TCFD. There's the carbon cl- disclosure project. Um, you know, it's it's definitely here to stay in, in any industry. Um, just like we've we've navigated the health and safety <laughs> <laughs> and risk uh, risk assessment, you know, changes in the last 15 years, and, and this is, I guess, the the the, the sort of next chewy um, concern that everyone's going to have to have. And it is more admin, but it is an opportunity for us to all take action as well. Is there any, is there anything, um, what's the next stage for Albert? Is there, because b- you had uh, like a, um, for production and then people that, companies that support production. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we uh, we just touched on the climate, the, the on-screen opportunity as well. And, and, and absolutely, like, we've got a footprint as an industry, but we've got what I call a brain print, so we can reach audiences. And you can do it, through David Attenborough shows, you know, on the environment, on the nose. But you can also do it in sports programmes. You know, if you're just just talking about a a sportsman or woman who's uh, trying to plant-based diet, you know, sometimes it can be really just what we call it planet placement. And that's that's actually where we we can have a superpower to shift culture and get policy buy-in and support for sustainability. But the two are intertwined. And whatever role you play, whether you're in the editorial production side of of our industry 
it um, y you you definitely have influence. You know, if you are, um, uh, you know, if you're on su some of the traditional methods of filming as opposed to remote filming, have um, some a, a golden ticket to be able to be on site and capturing sustainability stories and feeding into commentators and um, and we've got to make sure if we do go down the sort of remote filming route that we don't lose that that opportunity to um, for audiences to get that palpable feeling and, and for the on-screen sustainability messages to be still heard. I think just equally as well in the so, that, so that's clear in the consumer space but as an industry in the in, in the business to business space, obviously we're at a trade show here today, and so I haven't wanted to run every single hall yet, but I'm, I'm trying to observe where there's messages around sustainability on on the stands, and it, I was quite disappointed to be honest. There's n there's mm. not that many stands. I've I've only come across three stands that have the word sustainability on their on the branding, and actually as an industry we also need to mature because we talk quite a lot about how sustainability is a core business value. But if you were walking around the stands today, now if, you, if, if something was a true business value, it would be, it, be on your branding. So there's a lot more that we need to do around communications around sustainability. So one last quick question. Aside from remote production and using the cloud, is there anything that we learned from lockdown that perhaps we didn't realize yeah, I, I'll, I'll just paint the picture. So the mm. emis average emissions associated with one hour of TV content, I've said earlier, pre-COVID was about 10 tonnes in the UK. It reduced to less than half of that under COVID. And that, that's an emissions intensity. That's not mm. just, you know, that's an average, not because there was a drop in productions. There was a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, and a lot of it, cloud and remote filming, but also more archive use. And, I, and we've seen a slight rebound in 2021. But I think people are going, we don't need to track, we don't need 10 execs to go on a recce anymore. We can do a virtual recce. We don't actually, you know, there's some real bonuses to remote filming and virtual studios and also using archive. Do we really need to send a cameraman to the Antarctic again to get the same shots? You know, penguins, we've, we've got it in the bank. So there's a lot more, again, collaboration. Um, but that's the, I'm sure you, you guys have had some other learnings as well. I think we've made, a, we've seen an awful lot of adjustment. I mean, when I was last at this conference, you wouldn't have seen Zoom as, a, as somebody who was here in presenting sort of format. It's how you now bake some of what has become accepted workarounds into what we do routinely. And uh, in order to just keep those and mature them and bake them in. Um, if Morrowind was here from, uh, from our news gathering UK operations team, um, she would take this, the lights of Zoom and the remote, the, the remote, the capacity to remotely contribute has, made, has been a game changer uh, in her organisation. We would often need to choose uh, guests, bearing in mind where our radio car was, where our vehicles were. Can we get one of the fleet over to them to get them on air, to get them to be interviewed? Now we can pretty much pick and choose who we want to interview, when we want to interview them, because we can get to them in their own homes using the technology it has been an absolute game changer, some of these techniques. Many of them, I mean, we still happily accept people being interviewed on Zoom, on, on flagship news bulletins, on the telly. That's just normal. And so I think that's probably been the largest change that we've seen that I would certainly want to see baked in for the long term. Yeah, I believe there's also the thing about um, thinking about it before doing it. In COVID, you had a lot of constraints. So you were there just like, how am I going to do it? Whether before we had a lot of let's do it and just like whatever it takes, you know, and um, and planning is the essence of carbon reduction. It's uh, planning and mutualizing. Get thing, get people together to find a solution before you're doing things. Not just like, oh, what we did, ah, oh, it could have been better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that is certainly something where, as an industry, we can make a, a big improvement by providing guidelines and experience and everything. And Albert has been doing great stuff with the. The, the uh, yearly report with data and everything and, 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 and good uh, just experience you know that that can be shared with people and, and then uh, oh I'm let, let's let's try doing next time anything and let, let's plan for it well it's, it's actually very difficult uh, for production because uh, uh, especially in, in, in drama and thing it's uh, in a lot of situations the um, uh, you know, it's a prototype, so uh, it's not the same people working together and everything. But as soon as you start to have guidelines for, you know, the guys doing this and on-set construction and, and transportation and catering and everything, once you have those information, those people can progress, and, and then the production 
can benefit from that. You know? and, and that is, we need to get more of this information shared among the, the different crafts and everything so uh, we can progress all together. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Uh, it's all about tax incentives, mm -hmm. and they are part of the financing of production. So how do you address that if you want to reduce the, uh, the cost of transportation? Well, that's very easy, change the tax system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because actually, uh, it's, I mean, they, uh, this industry in, in, in general uh, uses a lot of uh, those tax incentives and everything, and, and a lot of things, for example, flying is extremely cheap just because our taxes finance the uh, uh, <laughs> building planes and finance airports and finance kerosene and everything. If we had the real cost, flight, flying would be extremely expensive. That should come back to this, or the, or to reality. And, and that's the same for film production. At some point, we need to make incentives in the right place, you know, just for the, the good stuff to, to happen. And then people will adapt because s s s the, the most difficult part is that producers are extremely good at, with financial data because it's uh, 100 years of cinema, 100 years of how I'm going to do that and, and, and fine tune things and have, uh, you know, I can pick this there and look at a James Bond, you know, they look at the tax incentive there, that we're going to shoot there and there and there to follow the tax incentives. Uh, at some points, if the tax incentives are different, well, they will adapt. What is difficult now is that they are um, uh, playing with the carbon uh, budget is, is new whether playing with the financial budget is, you know, really what people are good at. The, the new concept is actually mixing the two, so that's a, a, another intellectual exercise. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very sure those people will be very extremely good at it. <laughs> yeah, and in the meantime, though, it's, you know, if there, is, is, if there is a tax incentive, it's making sure that that's tied to you have to use local crew. You can't just fly over yeah. people from you know, the US, because surely as well, the point is that y you can uh, help, you know, with the industry in that area. So th I think that has to ha be, uh, be tied in as well. Do we have any more questions? Oh, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much for coming along to, to see our panel today. Enjoy, thank you. Thank you enjoy your carbon footprinting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.